Well, hello everyone. Welcome again to yet another session uh, where we will speak with another wonderful Afghan in the diaspora. And for you to get to know us better um, and uh, just know the multi layers of uh, being an Afghan. So today I'm very excited to speak with uh, Samia Karimi, who is a dancer, activist, and a lot more. And um, so, so we'll get right to it. Uh, I know Samia John, you have just come to LA uh, just four or five months ago from the Bay Area. What brings you here? Uh, so, salam, hello everyone. Um, I grew up in the LA area actually. And although I was born in Afghanistan, I grew up here. And seven years ago, I moved to the Bay Area for work and also to pursue uh, more of a career in dance. And I uh, came back to LA uh, in August to be closer to my family. Uh, most of my family lives in Ventura County. And that was the main reason. But um, since I've arrived, um, uh, numerous new reasons have surfaced. And I'm so grateful that I'm here. That's wonderful. So speaking of arriving and travel, uh, why don't we start with, with the origin story? Tell us, tell us how did you or your family uh, got to the U.S. and where you are? Tell us about your journey starting from Afghanistan, as far back as you want to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, uh, I must say the only memory I have of Afghanistan, unfortunately, I left at the age of five, is um, waving goodbye to relatives as our car was driving away to Kabul airport. And I remember having that sense of confusion, like, where are we going? Are we coming back? And why, why is everybody heavy with emotion? Um, so, you know, I, we came to the United States as a, the first wave of Afghan uh, asylum seekers, refugees, immigrants. And this was directly um, as a result of my father working and having ties with the U.S. Embassy at the time. Now, he wasn't a political figure. He wasn't in the military. Um, but because he had ties to the U.S., um, it was critical that we leave at the time we did. So we pretty much escaped. Uh, we came to um, the San Fernando Valley, of all places, <laughs> because we had other friends and relatives here. And I grew up here um, as an immigrant, uh, remembering my first days in kindergarten, um, not speaking a word of English. The whole first six months here, six plus months, I was um, considered a mute because I didn't speak. And uh, wow. it, it took me a while to warm up to the new culture and as it did for many Afghans. Um, so I grew up here in San Fernando Valley, and I've been a California girl um, most of my life. That's wonderful. Um, that, I mean, you already kind of described or, or answered my next question was kind of how was it growing up um, here, you know, at such a young age? Uh, when you grew up a kind of a little bit later years, once you did learn English, I'm sure as a younger person, you adopted the language a lot quicker than those who come as adults. How was your experience, you know, middle school, high school, uh, those, those around those times where one forms identity? Yeah, I think I recognized early on that if I do well academically, I will both please my parents and make friends with not only other kids, but with teachers. So I remember all throughout elementary school, both me and my other sisters staying after school doing extra help with the teacher, bringing roses to our teachers. And and I think it was like, you know, it, it, it may have been overkill at times, but I think in, in our hearts, we knew that, you know, we wanted to belong. We wanted to be a part of, of the community. Um, in middle school, there was bullying. <laughs> you know, I was bullied because uh, I went to a school where half the school were white, wealthy kids who lived in the hills and half the half the students were, um, you know, from, you know, 
Latinx backgrounds and uh, they lived in the downtown area. And then here I come, this Afghan, I don't speak Spanish. I don't, you know, I, I it's, it was hard for me to fit in to either of those groups. So I was bullied a lot in sixth grade, seventh grade. Um, but, you know, high school, I adjusted a little bit more. And then college is when I really kind of went back to my identity as a Muslim. And I studied Islamic studies at, uni at the university. Um, and I kind of went inward spiritually as well. Um, it wasn't until my later years, though, my 30s and now my 40s, that I'm really like thirsting. And, uh, you know, I feel like I need to reconnect to my Afghan roots, you know. So, uh, that's, this is where I find myself now as a, as a dancer, as a lover of Afghan music and dance, is, is trying to reconnect to that part of my identity um, as an adult. Right, right. When was your first introduction to dance? And, and I know being outside of Afghanistan, I'm sure you haven't, you probably just saw Afghan dance on TV or, or maybe at, at weddings and other, other places. Or, or where was kind of your first introduction to dance, uh, Afghan dance specifically? I'm sure you saw other dances, of course, growing up here. You're exposed to so many different dance forms. But when it comes to Afghan dance, how was your introduction to that? Yes, Afghan dance, actually, because it's not so well documented on TV or it's not, it's not shown, um, or it wasn't, at least when I was growing up, I became exposed to it at, at weddings, mainly, at Afghan parties. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there were a lot of parties, maimonis that my parents had, um, where somebody brought a tabla and harmonia, you know, and after we ate, we would sit down and sing and listen to music. At that time, I wasn't actively dancing, but as I went into my teenage years, um, I instinctively wanted to go onto the dance floor um, because of the music. So music has always been a gateway for me. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I enjoy the music more if I feel it in my body and I interpret it in my body. Um, it's it's like an intimate dance with 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 the instruments, with the with the lyrics. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, you know when you go to Afghan parties, you may or may not know. Uh, there's always like a critical mass of people who will get on the dance floor when you feel like, okay, now I can go <laughs> and hide. And so I was always the one, you know, just kind of hiding a little bit in the center and, and dancing with the crowd. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't until I started taking dance classes that I thought of dance more as a performing arts. And although dance brought me joy, it was it, growing up in my family, it wasn't encouraged. Um, and not that it was discouraged uh, actively, but, you know, we never really spoke about it. Um, you know, on Afghan TV, you, you really, you might see Afghan dancers in videos, but they're mostly, they're not Afghan, they're Tajik or they're Uzbek or they're from another nationality or they're Indian in Bollywood films. So as a teenager, I remember um, aspiring to be one of the Bollywood dancers, like just looking at them with, with candy eyes. And um, so, you know, when the time came for me, I did take some dance classes and I took them secretly, secretly from my parents. <laughs> this was when I was already married. Um, and then when I went to the Bay Area, I was telling you earlier, one of the reasons I moved up there is because I discovered a dance company, Ballet Afsane, who uh, really uplifted Central Asian dance and different dance forms of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, um, Persian classical. Um, and it was very much a Ballet Afsane style of these dance forms. But um, I also saw Afghan dance. I saw Atan mm -hmm. on stage, you know, mm -hmm. being performed by 20 girls. And, mm -hmm. and I was in LA watching this on YouTube and thinking, who are these people? <laughs> you know, are there any Afghans there? Who are they? You know, and what, how is it that they are, you know, they have a live audience engaged? And mm -hmm. so I moved to the Bay Area for work. I was in biotech at the time. But I started taking dance classes with this dance company. 
And then I mm. auditioned and I became one of the dancers. This was about six years ago from now. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, we can't talk, we'll go into your personal story too, but we can't talk about Afghan dance and not explain probably the most popular Afghan dance, which is the Atan, which has survived uh, thousands of years probably. And as now is considered a national dance. I wonder if you could explain to, to our audience kind of the origins of Atan or just anything about the Atan, uh, mm -hmm. which very specifically um, belongs to the, you know, that region. Um, what can you say about the Atan? Yeah, for sure. From what I know of Atan, and I am not an Atan expert yet, um, um, but I from like what I know, yes. I, well, yes. <laughs> that's one of my goals, I'll, I'll be honest with you, because, um, you know, as you were saying, it has been around for thousands of years, you know, there are even Greco records i mean supposedly records of it in greek times and so i think from what i've learned is that it is a dance form that was done before battle with uh, mostly men and it was to really you know pump up the the, the men before a fight uh, as we know it in our lifetime it is <clears throat> mostly done for celebration it is done at the end of a wedding you know, Atan, as soon as you hear the Atan music and everybody knows what the Atan music is, you know, okay, my last tea, you know, my last cup of tea, the wedding's going to be over soon. It's the last dance. And it's, mm -hmm. um, and so I witnessed it at weddings, but I witnessed the very simple, you know, like hand clap out in very simple. I didn't really see the complex forms until I joined Ballet Afsani. And so I learned mm -hmm. a version of Atan through Ballet Afsani um, that involves spinning, going up and down, um, jumping, and, and your heart rate really gets gets pumped. Uh, right. I have taken some Atan workshops, for example, with the Atan girls who are in Europe and they teach workshops. They're more dedicated to sh showing the variety of Atan forms. Uh, it's very regional. It, um, you know, the, the, the borders that we know as Afghanistan, Pakistan, it, they're very porous when it comes to these dance forms. And so Atan exists on in Pakistan side, with, you know, the Pashtun tribes. And just the other day I learned through my friend Lamar that in his, um, in his ethnic group, Afghan ethnic group, they would do a Sherbazi before they did Atan. So they would, they would actually recite poems and have a poem battle before mm -hmm. they actually did the physical movements, the physical form of the Atan. And so that was new for me. I'm always discovering something new. My goal really is maybe working with the Atan girls or other teachers who are out there to document all these Atans. And that will require a lot of research. It will require dedicated dancers um, to, to preserve it in its pure form. Right, right, right. What drew you to, to dance? Uh, you know, of all the art forms out there, what do you think is so unique about dance uh, and maybe even Afghan dance that, that you think needs preservation or promotion? <laughs> yeah, I mean, dance is, uh, it is a language. Dance, as I've been saying, um, is a container for history. Um, it is an art form. It is a form of expression. And uh, the thing about dance is it can only be documented and maintained in the body. I mean, obviously you can, you can describe it in as many words as possible, but until you actually do it in the body, until you document it visually with music, which is usually the case, um, until you do that, then it, it can't fully be appreciated. And why does it need to be appreciated and, and um, documented? Um, there are dance forms, for example, another dance form that I'm, I'm very curious about exploring are the Azora dance forms, um, such as Pishpo. I've heard very little about it. I've seen some documentation. There's a really sweet documentary on YouTube um, that tells the story of a wedding celebration in an Azora community it's a little village and then at the end they show a, a little piece of this dance and from what i witnessed it's um 
I'm very curious how old this dance is. It's very different than the social Afghan dance that we've seen and the dance that I perform. Um, and I would argue that there are even maybe shamanic roots to this dance form. Um, so, you know, pe people throughout the world, throughout history have used dance um, for celebration, for joy, for telling stories. Mm -hmm. for preserving their culture, just as music is in other art forms. But unfortunately, in our culture, um, and, I, and I speak on a global level, dance hasn't been elevated um, to that status uh, as other art forms have, mm -hmm. especially in Afghanistan. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's barely talked about, and dance is, the word rax is equated to even um sex work or you know or, sh or showing mm -hmm. the body appropriately um and my one of my goals mm -hmm. is to change and shatter that narrative right right yeah and that is kind of the unfortunate as, as you mentioned not only uh, in afghan culture but in a lot of cultures yeah the dance the connection between dance and sexuality are so tied together that those who want to explore dance without the sexuality angle kind of face a lot of yeah. troubles like yourself. I'm sure if you were to dance on your own on stage, it would probably be seen very different than if you were to dance in a tan, in a social dance, which is part of a group of people, it would probably yes. be seen very differently, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. I've, I've had situation a situation where, you know, I was invited to dance and then as soon as i said i would be alone i was dismissed and, and told not to come <laughs> <laughs> right right because it's, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know i get it but then what happens is that then people um people miss out on the other values of dance i'm also a dance teacher i've been teaching creative dance to children in schools and after school programs i'm currently doing an internship through luna dance institute where i'm teaching family dance to a women's shelter and these are women who you know who are overcoming abuse domestic abuse or they've been separated from their child and what we're really doing is we're we're creating an environment where they can bond with their children reconnect with them their the child within but the child in front of them through movement through dance and we're seeing very positive results so dance you know it it connects people it bonds it connects you to yourself dance is also a form of play for children um, there are huge cognitive benefits social socio-emotional benefits these have all been proven there's lots of research around this but when you google dance what mm -hmm. do you see what comes up you know yeah. all you see is like ballet modern dance um jazz you know and you don't you you're not you don't really get uh, a full sense of the power of of movement of creative mm -hmm. movement um, it's freedom. Right. Ultimately, dance, if you can move your body freely and express yourself, even if nobody is watching, you know, express yourself for, for just the joy of, of movement and expression, that is in itself is, is value. And people are threatened, especially for women, to move their body freely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know in your own work, perhaps in the past few months, since the, the recent changes in government and what's been happening in Afghanistan, you have even taken your dance and art form and elevated it to kind of also serve social justice uh, issues and, and kind of raise awareness. Can you tell me a little bit about how you've been able to do that in the past few months? Yeah, what definitely. You about that? Um, as as a dancer, my worldview about dance has shifted uh, drastically in the last few months. Um, I mean, this has been happening. It's been a question and inquiry I've always had, like, what about dance and social justice? What about arts and social justice? You know, I've, I've had this question for for a long time. And um, now, since August of this year, uh, things shifted very quickly for me and I really had to pause, step back and actually even physically, you know, I, I found myself stuck creatively 
um, because first I had to an answer that question. Okay, so I am a dancer, so what can I offer? So I'm an artist, what can I offer my people? What can I offer the world? I, I remember the very first thing I did is I made my Instagram um, page public. And that was like a huge no for me for many years because um, mm -hmm. of Taliban minded people. I did not want to be found out as an Afghan dancer. I really didn't. You know, I, I, I was worried about, okay, what if somebody takes, you know, takes my story and exploits it in a wrong way and shames me publicly. Um, but it wasn't until I saw, you know, the the Afghan women protesting on the streets of Kabul, of the streets of Herat, wherever, uh, with their signs that I was like, what am I afraid of? You know, I'm sitting here privileged. What am I afraid of? I am going to make it public and I'm going to use my um, social presence, social media presence to uplift voices of those people who who may need their voices heard. So right. um, one of the things I did right away is, uh, you know, my, my dear friend Natalie through Pomegranate Garden Dance, who's a colleague of mine who I've danced with for years, she runs an online dance school and she she approached me and she asked me, do you want to do a fundraiser, you know, a dance series? And so um, one of the things we did right away is I offered my dance classes um, and made sure that a percentage or 100 percent of the proceeds went to uh, support Afghan artists. Mm -hmm. um, we also did a workshop to fundraise for um, Enabled Children's Initiative, who works in Afghanistan with disabled uh, families, um, mm -hmm. but they're also doing. They're also um, working with the humanitarian crisis needs in Afghanistan. Right now, my dance series that I'm teaching this month is to support um, an Azora, mostly Azora group of hip hop artists who escaped Kabul recently, uh, right. called AK13 or Superior Crew, which is a um, breakdancing group who came out of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Right. There was, there was that. Like, how can I, how can I channel money the right places? And then the other thing I've done recently is, um, you know, I connected with an Afghan poet in Kabul. She's a woman. She's an educator. She's written volumes of poetry, and um, you know, and, and the question for her is, what, what is going to happen to my poetry? What, you know she was getting ready to publish a book you know with her poems um and i don't believe she's teaching right now um mm -hmm. but what i did is i i listened to one of her poems that we presented at an la protest and i reached out to her and i said i really want to know what this means can can i work with you to translate this and you know i i'm still working on a on a good translation <laughs> um but i translated to the point where i can kind of maybe feel what she was feeling, maybe maybe get a sense of the essence of the poem. And I created some movement, some perf um, performance art movement. It's not mm -hmm. traditional Afghan movement. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm presenting it tomorrow night at the Refugees and Transitions Annual Gala. And oh, wonderful. So to raise money for refugee resettlement in the Bay Area, but to uplift, mm -hmm. you know, a, a poet who, mm -hmm. who is a beautiful poet who's speaking about freedom, who's speaking against oppression. Um, right. Yeah. So right now, really my art form is like, how do I how do I uplift these voices? And where I it's not really about me. It shouldn't as an artist, I don't think it should always be about you. It should be about like, you know, the collective, the collective, perhaps. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the glad. And and speaking of refugees, you know, uh, I hear one something that has brought you back to LA is this uh, new job or position which you will be doing, working with refugee resettlements. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? What what you're going to be up to, uh, work wise or or a different work wise? So this is a, a recent development. When I left the Bay Area five months ago, now I think. I really don't know what was going to happen in LA, and right away, I, I you know, I, I was um, fortunate enough to meet other Afghan grassroots organizers, and through them, I, you know, 
we we keep each other informed we support each other it's a beautiful community and we connect almost daily um we all have our own work that we do everybody's working around the clock to support you know afghans back home afghans here and other causes as well mm -hmm. um i knew that i always wanted to work with refugees. Uh, the first time I worked with Afghan refugees was when I finished college and I was in Kyrgyzstan as a Peace Corps volunteer. So I lived in Kyrgyzstan for two and a half years. Um, half the time I, I taught English in my village, half the time I worked at a Fun Muhajir, which was an NGO in the city. And we, um, you know, I, I taught English, I helped them build an education center. We had women's craft circles. And I remember a moment I was visiting a family's home with the UNHCR and they were telling me their story. And I'll never forget like the, the husband's eyes. Like he was just, he had been silent for months because he saw his own brothers and family being killed in front of him. You know, and this was back in, um, right before 9-11 actually. <laughs> that this happened and and I remember sitting there and feeling helpless like I should be able to do something why can't I do something to help this family and I always in the back of my head thought okay well I'm going to go back and I'm going to become a human rights lawyer and I'm going to do this and that and become a diplomat and um 20 years of detour <laughs> brought me finally to working with refugees again um, so, you know, International Institute of Los Angeles is an organization that's been around since 1914 in Los Angeles. They've helped a variety of different refugee communities. Right now, with thousands of Afghans pouring out of these military bases, you know, who have been evacuated and brought to the U.S., um, they need Afghans to be there to greet them. Mm hmm and right. to plug them into the resources that they need uh, uh, to just speak their language, you know? And so I really, you know, I, I have applied to, I applied to several jobs similar to this. And then finally, you know, I got, I got an interview and a call with them. And I believe Monday is my, <laughs> my start day. Um, I, I'm a little nervous to be honest, but I'm also, um, ready i'm so ready for this job i i really want to uh you know i want to support them in whatever way i can whether yeah. my farsi is broken or not <laughs> i think it's good enough to be there where they need support hopefully that's wonderful that's great that's great and i i wish you luck on this new endeavor and journey and and i love that you said it was 20 years in the making and sometimes i think certain yeah. ideas an inception comes at a certain point, but then it takes time to uh, to come to fruition, you know. Uh, so in the last few minutes that we have, we got another two or three minutes left or a minute. Um, was there anything uh, that uh, you wish to have shared that I did not ask you that you would like to share, whether it was about dance, about yourself, about anything uh, or any conclusive thoughts? Yeah, I, I really think that um... The struggles that Afghanistan and Afghans are facing right now, I really believe that each one of us has a role. You know, you may think, oh, I'm not qualified, or I, I don't speak the language, or I don't, you know, I, I never lived in Afghanistan, how can I help? Everybody needs to step it up. I, I can't stress that enough. Um, the main thing is like, don't don't stick to social media as you being your only new source. First of all, <laughs> it's very surface level, and uh, you know we really we really need to have deep, long conversations about things. But don't just talk. You know, there's so much you can do. Uh, the refugee resettlement agencies that are doing the work right now, um, staff are underpaid, under resourced. Um, it's not their fault but they also rely heavily on volunteers so maybe maybe you want to mentor someone maybe you want to be a tutor maybe you want to offer a draw a ride for someone um, maybe you want to donate a backpack to a student um, so 
you know, I just invite all of you to uh, to do whatever you can and, and, and reach out if, if you need to be connected to these agencies or other organizations. Um, it's, it's within reach.